For the scripture reading, we are in Luke 24, starting at verse 1 and going till verse 12. So Luke 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed down their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee? that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day and, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to be an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes, cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Thank you, Helena, and uh, Stephanie and, and Joshua for leading us in uh, singing. <coughs> Christ is risen. Amen. Uh, it's good to see each one of you here this morning for Resurrection Sunday. Uh, last year, we did not have this privilege. Uh, last year, our church service was... Uh, solely online, which was uh, very weird for me. I didn't like it at all. Uh, this year, though, we are able to, uh, to gather together, albeit with restrictions, uh, but it's good. It's good to be able to uh, celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead together as the church. Uh, it just seems, just seems more, more fitting. <coughs> uh, recently, our, our family has been reading through a series of children's books, called The Green Ember. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. Uh, but the, the series is set in the land of Natalia, where rabbits with swords, you heard me right, rabbits with swords, battle for their freedom against birds of prey and wolves. It, it's, it's excellent. It's like Lord of the Rings meets Peter Rabbit. It's, it's amazing. <clears throat> um, we, we purchased the first book in this series, which is called The Green Ember, uh, because we had heard so many good things about it, and, and I think Helena and I have enjoyed it more than the kids have. Um, so much so that we actually we went out and purchased uh, three more books in the series. So, I mean, we're all in. I think there's like nine books, so we're, we're going. So, um, yeah, but the, but the first book is about uh, Heather and Pickett, who are young rabbits who live with their parents and baby brother Jax. Uh, after a series of unfortunate events, which I won't say because I don't want to give too much away, uh, <coughs> Heather and Pickett, you know, because you're going to want to read it, right? Uh, Heather and Pickett, they find themselves at this place called Cloud Mountain, where they're safe for the time being. Uh, and at Cloud Mountain, they learn about the betrayal and death of King Jupiter and that a war is imminent. Uh, but that a descendant of King Jupiter will rise up and usher in this time of peace called the Mended Wood. They, they say it all the time, you know, the, the Mended Wood, and uh, it's, uh, it kind of gets your, gets your hopes up. Um, but while they're at Cloud Mountain, Pickett, he learns how to fight in combat from a, an older and wiser rabbit named Helmer. And Helmer, he really has no interest in Pickett. He actually thinks that uh, Pickett is too idealistic, believing that they can actually win this war uh, that is, is coming. Helmer is more of a, he's a more of a pessimist, although some might call him a realist, you know. Uh, but in a conversation with Pickett, Helmer says to him, listen, son, in real life, bad things happen all the time. You miss your only chance to do something great. 
You don't measure up when it counts. Your mother gets sick and dies. The flood destroys your home. And that's it. It's gone. The fact is, I served King Jupiter, and I loved him. But this ain't a bedtime story, lad. The king was killed. We lost. It's over. No happy ending here. The mended wood is a child's motto to keep alive the pathetic hopes of rabbits who just need to face facts. It's all over. The glory is behind us. It's the sad end of a happy tale. Helmer looks around at the many rabbits who are working and talking and eating and laughing, and, and then he turns to Pickett and he says to him, I've been a soldier all my life, Pickett. I've been with many at the end. We're alone here, and the stories are all wrong. Nothing ends well. We're going to lose, Pickett. The stories are all wrong. On Good Friday, uh, we looked at the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. We read about the pain and the anguish Jesus experienced. We read about how Jesus took our place and bore the punishment and judgment against sin we deserved. And we read about how after Jesus died on the cross, he was buried in a tomb. And you can almost hear the words of Helmer, right? The king was killed. It's all over. We're going to lose. Nothing ends well. The stories are all wrong. And certainly, if that was where the story ended, then yes, it would be all over and there would be no hope. If that was where the story ended, then there would be no reason for gathering together this morning, or any Sunday morning for that matter, because Jesus would still be dead and buried. If that was where the story ended. But praise God, the story doesn't end there. If you have a Bible this morning, we're, we're going to be looking at Luke 24, verses 1 to 12. And in this passage, we are going to be confronted with the reason for the hope that is in us. Good Friday, as dark and gloomy as it was, is not the sad end of a happy tale. We have hope in a amended wood of our own, where all that is sad and wrong will be made right because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And so if you have your Bibles open to Luke 24, we're going to begin in verse 1. Luke writes, But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking spices they had prepared. The first thing we notice in our text is the intentions of the women. The intentions of of the women. We, we need to understand that the women came to the tomb on that first Easter Sunday anticipating that Jesus would still be dead. They, they weren't going to the tomb that Sunday morning expecting a resurrection. They weren't going to the tomb to check and see if it was empty. They figured it would be full. They were going to the tomb with the spices that they had prepared to anoint what they thought was the decaying body of Jesus. They fully anticipated that Jesus would still be dead. This was their, their intention. But when they approached the tomb where Jesus had been laid, it says that they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, skeptics will argue that the women didn't actually know where Jesus was buried, that they simply got wrong directions, and, and they went to the wrong tomb, and upon finding that tomb empty, they wrongly assumed that Jesus rose from the dead. But that would be impossible, since Matthew 27, verse 61, clearly states that when Joseph took the body of Jesus down from the cross and wrapped it in a linen shroud and put it in his own tomb, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. They knew where Jesus was buried. 
Uh, even when the guards bring the report of the resurrection to the Jewish leaders in Matthew 28, and, and they're coming up with a story to cover it up because they don't like the truth, right? They, they don't say to the guards, tell people the women just went to the wrong tomb. Why? Because they know better than that. They know that the women couldn't have gone to the wrong tomb because they saw where he was buried. No, the women go to the right tomb. They go to the tomb where Jesus was buried. And when they find the stone rolled away and the tomb empty, Luke says that they were perplexed. They were perplexed. They were at a loss. Where do we go from here? In the book, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, after Aslan has just been killed by the White Witch, Susan and Lucy make their way to the stone table upon which Aslan's body laid. And after what seems like several hours of crying over the, the death of Aslan, they decide to go for a walk. But after they, they turn and they walk for a little bit, they're, they're looking at the, the sunrise, they hear a loud cracking noise. They're scared to turn around. But Lucy says, they're doing something worse to him. Come on. And when they get back to the stone table, they're shocked to see it broken in two pieces, pieces and, and Aslan not there. What does it mean, Susan cries? Is it more magic? Yes, it is more magic, Aslan says in a deep, loud voice from behind them. And the girls turn around to see Aslan alive. Had the Jewish leaders taken the body of Jesus? Had the Romans come back to do worse things to him? What could all of this mean? Is it more magic? we're, We're almost expecting Jesus to come out and say, yes, it is more magic. But he would show himself gradually to individuals as time went on. But, but we can understand the perplexed reaction of the women, can't we? After all, they had, just, they had just witnessed the brutal death of their Lord. They had been at the foot of the cross where Jesus was crucified. They had seen the spear thrust into his side and the mixture of blood and water poured out. They had seen Jesus buried. They had seen what they believed to be the sad end of a happy tale. But now they were staring at an empty tomb. They were staring at linen garments with no body in them, and they're perplexed. They're at a loss. But as the women are standing there with all these questions circling around in their minds, two angels appear, and suddenly the women go from perplexed to afraid. They bow themselves before the angels. But it's what the angels say to the women that's of notice here. And so the second thing we we notice is the message of the angels. We see the intentions of the women and now the the message of the angels. In verse 5, the angels say to the women, Why do you seek the, (laughs) the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Uh, and what I think is really, really neat is that the angels go from announcing the Savior's birth to shepherds to announcing the Savior's resurrection to women. And what a glorious message it is. The, these women have gone from perplexed to afraid, but, but now you can imagine what joy has filled their hearts. He is not here, but is risen. Re- remember, they, they, these women were the first skeptics. They had gone to the tomb to anoint a dead body. But they find that this place was not a place of death, but a place of life. This place was not a place of despair and defeat, but a place of victory and triumph. 
Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Jesus has defeated the powers of sin and death and hell. He bore our sin and our shame, our punishment on the cross. We do not have hope this morning in a dead Savior. We have hope this morning in a risen Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what a glorious message from the angels. The angels continue in verse 6. Remember. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And you can almost see the, the wheels beginning to turn. As Luke tells us that the women remembered his words. Oh, yeah, you know, Jesus did say something about that, didn't he? Yes, as a matter of fact, Jesus foretold his death and resurrection a few times. In, in Luke 9, 22, Jesus said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by, by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And, and again, in Luke 18, verses 31 to 33, uh, Jesus said, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. Now, after reading what we read through on Good Friday, that sounds very much like exactly what happened. And so it is that he has risen from the dead on the third day. You know, we, we think to ourselves, how, how did they not see it coming, right? They, they had traveled with Jesus. They had seen the many miracles. They had seen Jesus raise other people from the dead. They had heard the, the teachings of Jesus about the coming kingdom. They, they believed Jesus to be the king. How did they not go to the tomb that Sunday morning expecting it to be empty? But the thing is, we, we have the privilege today of, of living on this side of the cross and resurrection of Jesus. You know, we, we like to think that we would have known better than them if we had been there. We, we like to think that we would have reacted differently on that first Easter Sunday morning. But the only reason we, we think that is because we are able to take a step back and we're able to have the whole story in front of us. And yet, even though we, we have the whole of Scripture and, and nearly 2,000 years of church history to draw on, we are no different we still have trouble believing in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Why I say that is because we might say Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, but then we doubt God's goodness. And we live in despair by what we see all around us. And if God raised Jesus from the dead... Can we not count on God to care for us in our various situations? I, I don't know where this morning finds you, but, but this is not a morning of despair and doubt. The message of the angels is the good news that Jesus has risen from the dead. He is alive, and there is hope today because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives.
And so we've seen the intentions of the women. We've seen the message of the angels. And thirdly here, we, we notice the unbelief of the disciples. The unbelief of the disciples. Look at verses 9 to 11. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the, all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. The word used for idle tale literally means nonsense. One commentator writes that this word was used to refer to the delirious stories told by the very sick as they suffer in great pain or to tales told by those who fail to perceive reality. (laughs) The disciples think that these women are dreaming. They're out of their minds. They think that they're sick with grief and telling them some kind of tall tale, something of a mended wood. Something out of the green ember. That's what they thought of the resurrection of Jesus. It's just some story that the women conjured up. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter to them that Jesus said he would rise again on the third day. It doesn't matter to them what the women said about the tomb being empty and, and about angels telling them that Jesus had risen. It doesn't matter to them that there were no other reasonable explanations for their claim other than that a resurrection had occurred. It doesn't matter. They would not believe. Charles Spurgeon said, what an emptying power unbelief has. No news could ever be more full of solace than the news of a risen Savior. But to the ears of unbelief, this news which made all heaven glad seem to the apostles, but as idle tales. It it sounds like these guys have been hanging around Helmer, doesn't it? Listen, ladies, the king was killed. The glory is behind us. The resurrection, that's just something to keep alive the pathetic hopes of Jesus' followers who just need to face facts. It's all over. We lost. But praise God that he uses the weak to shame the strong. We think that this would dismantle the testimony of the resurrection, right? Like if the disciples of Jesus can't agree on whether a resurrection happened, then why should we believe it? But it turns out that the unbelief of the disciples is actually one of the strongest evidences that Jesus rose from the dead. It's one of the strongest evidences for the resurrection. Because if at first they were slow to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, despite all the evidence, but then grew to be so thoroughly persuaded of its truth that they preached it everywhere, suffering persecution and even death as a result, then Christ must have risen from the dead. You don't go from skeptic to believer for no reason. (laughs) You go from skeptic to believer because you've been convinced of its truthfulness. You've been persuaded of its arguments that there is nothing left for you to do but believe. And how does that happen? How do you go from skeptic to believer that, that quickly? Well, one really good reason is that the risen Christ appeared to them. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8, which uh, Elwood read uh, this morning in our remembrance service, uh, the Apostle Paul writes, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, to Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, so you could ask them if you wanted to, though some have fallen asleep. 
Then he appeared to James and to the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. That's pretty significant. You know, if the testimony of the women doesn't convince you, then surely seeing the risen Christ with your own eyes should certainly do it. And for some of the disciples, like, like Thomas, it does. In, in John chapter 20, verse 25, Thomas says to the rest of the disciples, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. But then just over a week later, Jesus shows himself to Thomas and tells him to touch his hands and his side, and Thomas does, and he believes. And Jesus says to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. There are many today who refuse to believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Uh, I've read several statistics recently saying that uh, fewer and fewer people, including those who identify as Christians, believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, You may be here this morning and, and you do not fully believe. Or you know family, friends that do not believe. And I get that. Be- being a Christian is the hardest thing you will ever do because you don't have the risen Christ to look upon. We, we worship and we serve a God we do not see. You do not have the ability to see in Jesus' hands the mark of the nails. You, do, you don't have the ability to, to place your hand to his side and yet you're being asked to trust this Jesus with your soul. I get it. The, the message itself even seems too good to be true, doesn't it? I mean, who, who would believe that the Son of God would give up the glory of heaven, come to earth as a man, suffer rejection and shame and cruelty at the hands of sinful men? willingly go to a cross to pay the penalty for our sins, even though he was entirely perfect and innocent himself, die there, and then rise again from the dead on the third day so that all those who put their faith in him will be saved from condemnation and raised to everlasting blessedness when Christ returns to fully and finally restore all things. It sounds like an idle tale. But it's exactly what Jesus did. But this brings us to the last thing we notice. And that's the decision of Peter. The decision of Peter. There there was something something about the report of the women that, that stirs something up in Peter to go check it out. Maybe it's because he had put his foot in his mouth one too many times that he finally thinks before speaking. Maybe his recent denial of Jesus had caused him to to trust what Jesus had said. Whatever the case, Peter decides to check out the story for himself. Verse 12 says that Peter rose and ran to the tomb. John actually records that that John outran him, which I think is just a really neat, Interjection into the story. Uh, yeah. When Peter gets there, he stoops in, stoops, looks in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Just like the women had said, Peter finds the tomb empty and the grave clothes with no body in them. And he goes home marveling. You know, it almost seems kind of anticlimactic, right? He, what do you do when you see an empty, when you see the empty tomb? He, he just goes home, but he goes home marveling. He had heard the intentions of the women, and the the message of the angels, the unbelief of the disciples. But he had to make the decision himself whether he was going to believe 
the resurrection of Jesus. And the same is true for us today. What we have before us is the true story of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. But I can't make the decision for you to believe it. You must make the decision yourself whether you will believe the resurrection of Jesus. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart you what one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So the question is, ha- have you done that? Have we done that? Ha- have we made the decision to believe that the resurrection of Jesus actually happened? If you've not made the decision, I encourage you to do so today. Because what we see in the rest of Scripture, and you go all the way to the end, to, to, to Revelation, what we see is that since Christ has been raised from the dead, we know that all those who trust their souls to this Jesus will be raised from death to life when Jesus comes again to usher in our own version of the mended wood. It's not just some idle tale. In Revelation chapter 21 and 22, we see this this garden city that's so glorious and where all that is wrong will be made right because of Jesus. I listened to an audio book this week called The Biggest Story by Kevin D. Young where he leads uh, children and parents on a journey through the Bible connecting the dots from the the Garden of Eden to Christ's death on the cross to the new heaven and new earth. And at the end of the the book, D. Young writes, we live in the beginning of the end of the story that we are still in the middle of. Kind of just blows your mind already right there, right? We know it's not the end because we haven't made it back to the garden. We get glimpses of the garden here and there in our hearts, in our families, in the church. But anyone who loves this story longs to see the one who is the center of the story. The snake crusher is coming back again to wipe away all the bad guys and to wipe away every tear. He's coming to make a new beginning and to finish what he started. Is coming to give us the home we once had and might have forgotten that we lost. So keep waiting for him. Keep believing in him. Keep trusting that the story isn't over yet. God's promises never fail and the promised one never disappoints. One day we will see him. One day we will be with him. One day there will be nothing but the best days, day after day after day, forever and ever. That is the hope that we have because Jesus has risen from the dead. In real life, bad things happen. There is sickness, there is death, there are pandemics, and natural disasters, and injustice, and persecution, and suffering. But these are not the sad end of a happy tale. It's not all over. We have not lost. The stories are not all wrong. We live in the beginning of the end of the story that we are still in the middle of, and there is a happy ending in store for all those who trust in the risen Christ. Where do you stand this morning? Do you believe that Jesus is alive? Or does all of this sound like an idle tale. May we believe, even though we have not seen, and may we have hope in the happy ending that is coming for all those who believe, because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the glory of the resurrection. 
Uh, We thank you for the work of the gospel in our lives, bringing us to this glorious place where we will serve you and love you and praise your name forever and ever, fully satisfied in your presence and in perfect joy. May we understand, God, the seriousness of what we have looked at this morning. This is the reason for the hope that we have. If the resurrection is not true, then all of this is not true either. And so we ask that you would give us boldness to proclaim its truthfulness, but to do so with gentleness and respect. Use us, God, in whatever capacity you see fit to point those around us who do not believe pointing them to the hope of a new heaven and a new earth. God, cause your spirit to stir our affections towards these precious truths, never letting them go, but holding on to them all the more. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is alive and is seated with you at your right hand. Amen.